Stalin decided to increase strength of the Red Army starting in January 1939. The nationalist faction backed by Germany and Italy in the Spanish Civil War won in March 1939. Yezhov was arrested in April 1939 and the Great Terror ended after he was replaced by Lavrenti Beria. On 3rd of May 1939, Stalin replaced his foreign minister Maxim Litvinov with Vyacheslav Molotov. In that same month, Germany began negotiations with USSR to divide Eastern Europe. On August 23, 1939, the infamous Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was signed between Germany and the USSR. A week later, Germany started the Second World War by invading Poland on 1st September 1939. Britain declared war on Germany. Winston Churchill rejoined the British cabinet. Stalin supported Hitler. He told the world, It is not Germany who has attacked England and France, but England and France who have attacked Germany. On 17 September, USSR invaded Poland as well. Both Germany and USSR divided Poland. Germany killed about 60,000 Polish Jews and the Polish ruling class. Stalin told his inner circle, A war is on between two groups of capitalist nations. Hitler, without understanding it or desiring it, shaking and undermining the capitalist system, we can maneuver, pit one side against the other to set them fighting with each other as fiercely as possible. He also said, what would be the harm if as the result of the rout of Poland, we were to extend the socialist system onto new territories and populations? A German-Soviet frontier treaty was signed. Germany tried to circumvent the British blockade by trading with the USSR. While Stalin secretly admired Hitler, and Hitler despised what he called Judeo-Bolshevism, Hitler hoped for a long-term collaboration with Stalin, while Stalin saw no loyalty in Hitler, as he read Hitler's Mein Kampf. Stalin therefore set out to build a line of buffer zones to protect his empire. USSR then demanded parts of Finland. USSR invaded Finland in November 1939, but it became a humiliating struggle for the Red Army. More than 100,000 Soviet soldiers died in this war. Many Red Army officers were shot for this failure. USSR was expelled from the League of Nations. USSR signed a treaty and received territorial concessions from Finland. Joseph Goebbels Hitler's propaganda minister noted in his diary that the Red Army's incompetence offered Hitler more comfort. He wrote 15th of March 1940, The Russians can never become dangerous for us. If Stalin shoots his own generals, we won't need to do it. So far, we have nothing but advantages from our alliance with Russia. Stalin's NKVD killed about more than 20,000 Polish officers and political prisoners in April and May of 1940. This event is called the Katyn Massacre. On May 10, 1940, Hitler launched Blitzkrieg to the west. German army in defeated Belgium, Netherlands and Luxembourg. But most importantly, Hitler smashed France in six weeks. British were driven from the continental Europe. Paris surrendered and signed an armistice on June 22, 1940. What Germany couldn't do in World War I, Hitler and Nazi Germany did it with relatively little effort. In June 1940, the Red Army occupied the Baltic states. Stalin sent his congratulations to Hitler for his victories on the Western Front. But the war that Stalin anticipated between capitalist countries that would bring in socialism appeared to be quickly over. Nikita Khrushchev, Stalin's successor, recalled, I remember being with Stalin. He was extremely nervous. He was racing around. Cursing like a cab driver, he cursed the French, he cursed the British. How could they allow Hitler to defeat them, to crush them? Stalin not only saw the superiority of German army, he knew that the Germans sensed our weakness because of the war we, fought, we had fought with Finland. In August 1940, Trotsky was assassinated in Mexico. USSR annexed Bessarabia, a part of Romania. But it also annexed Bukovina, another part of Romania. This wasn't a part of Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and Hitler was alarmed. Hitler's chief of staff, General Fa Franz Halder, noted in his diary 
on 25th of June 1940. The issue of Bukovina raised by Russia is new and goes beyond our agreements with the Russians. Around the same time, Stalin received his first letter from Churchill. It was an appeal to Stalin to switch sides. Stalin did not reply. Instead, he rep- reported Churchill's approach to Berlin. Hitler now began his biggest miscalculation. On 19th July 1940, <coughs> Hitler made a plea for peace with Britain. On the same day, Franklin D. Roosevelt accepted nomination for Democratic Party in the USA. In October 1940, the Tripartite Pact was signed by Germany, Japan and Italy. Stalin also proposed that USSR join the Axis Alliance. On 12th November 1940, Molotov visited Berlin at Hitler's invitation. Hitler offered USSR a share of British Empire if it helped it finish the British. But Stalin wasn't interested in colonialism. He wanted to find out what Hitler's troops were up to in Finland and Romania. Molotov's cold and stubborn attitude offended Hitler. But Hitler also felt relieved to not keep fake niceties against his greatest enemy, Bolshevism. Stalin also realized that the war with Germany is imminent. In early December, Stalin told his generals, We know that Hitler is intoxicated by his victories and believes that the Red Army will need at least four years to prepare for the war. Obviously, four years would be more than enough for us. But we must be ready much earlier. We will try to delay the war for another for another two years. But Hitler was faster than Stalin anticipated. On 18th December 1940, he issued War Directive Number 21. The German Wehrmacht must be prepared before the ending of the war against England to crush Soviet Russia in a rapid campaign. The invasion was set for May 1941. It was Operation Barbarossa. He didn't know. USSR's military strength and hoped for the British surrender and American inactivity. Hitler decided to open the second front against USSR, the very thing he wanted to avoid and almost succeeded to avoid using the non-aggression pact. Stalin knew Hitler wanted to avoid war on two fronts. He knew Hitler had to deal with the British first. In 1941, Stalin told Politburo members, we must cherish no illusions. Fascist Germany is clearly preparing an attack on Soviet Union. Why does Hitler want to make an agreement with the England? Because he wants to avoid war on two fronts. In 13th April 1941, the Soviets signed a neutrality pact with Japan as a way to appease Nazi Germany to delay war and to avoid war on two fronts. When Japanese foreign minister left, Stalin told his German military attache, we must remain friends and you must do everything to that end. We will stay friends with you whatever happens. But Stalin knew this was just a lie. Soon after, Stalin told graduates at Moscow Military Academy, there will be war and the enemy will be Germany. Stalin was preparing steadily for the war. In April 1941, Stalin received a second letter from Winston Churchill. Churchill told him that the British received intelligence reports about German military movements in preparation of attack. Stalin was suspicious of Churchill. Stalin said, Britain is threatening us with the Germans and threatening the Germans with the Soviet Union. They are playing us off against each other. On 6th of May 1941, Stalin replaced Molotov as the premier of the Soviet Union. On 10th May 1941, Rudolf Hess landed in Scotland. Stalin said to his assistant about Hess, on one hand, Churchill sends us a personal message in which he warns us about Hitler's aggressive intentions and on the other hand, the British meet Hess, who is undoubtedly Hitler's confidant. What is the conclusion then? Apparently, when Churchill sent us his personal warning, he believed that we would activate our military machine. Then Hitler would have a direct and fair reason to launch a preventative crusade against the Soviet Union. Stalin brooded on this idea and thought it's not just Churchill. On 5th of June, Stalin sent to his, said to his military chiefs, England, France and America see in Germany the only hope to get rid of Bolshevism and therefore help Nazis in all possible ways in the crusade to the East. Multiple intelligence reports about German invasion were dismissed by Stalin. 
On 12th June, he told his generals, I am certain that Hitler will not risk creating a second front by attacking the Soviet Union. Hitler is not such an idiot. On 16th June 1941, Hitler told Goebbels that which we have spent our lives fighting will now annihilate. Whether right or wrong, we must win. And when we have won, who will ask about the methods? That day, a Soviet spy in Luftwaffe sent another warning of imminent German attack. Stalin retorted, Tell the source in the staff of the German Air Force to F his mother. On 18th June, Stalin stopped two generals, Zhukov and Timoshenko, pleaded with him for a full alert. Stalin said, You have to realize Germany will never fight Russia on their own. You must understand this. On the evening of 21st June 1941, Winston Churchill held a dinner party at his country residence outside London. Reports about Hitler's upcoming invasion of Russia was the main topic of conversation. John Colville, Churchill's secretary, noted, PM says he will go all out to help Russia. I said that for him, the arch-anti-communist. This was bowing down in the house. He replied he had only one single purpose, destruction of Hitler and his life was much simplified therefore. If Hitler invaded hell, he would at least make a favorable reference to the devil. On 22nd June 1941, Germany invaded the Soviet Union. The same day, Napoleon invaded Russia. Georgi Dimitrov wrote in his diary, At 7 a.m., I was urgently summoned to the Kremlin. Germany has attacked the USSR. The war has begun. Stalin to me. They attacked us without declaring any grievances, without demanding any no negotiations. They attacked us viciously, like gangsters. Stalin's conspiracy theory was shattered because of his misreading of Hitler. A few days later, Stalin remarked, Lenin founded our state and we have effed it up. Stalin also said, When you are trying to make a decision, never put yourself into the mind of the other person because if you do, you can make a terrible mistake. German blitzkrieg, just like with France, made rapid gains. Ukraine, Belarusia and Baltic states were under German control within weeks. By July, the German Luftwaffe was bombing Moscow. On 16th August 1941, Stalin gave order number 270, which banned commanders from surrendering. In August-September 1941, Iran was invaded by Allied powers of the Red Army in the north and by British in the center and south. On Stalin's birthday in 1941, the, the London Philharmonic Orchestra performed a concert, concert to celebrate his birthday. By October, the Wehrmacht attacked Moscow. Stalin sa stayed in Moscow to avoid damaging troop morale. In December 1941, the British Foreign, Minister, British Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden went to Moscow to start negotiations for a formal treaty with Russia. Eden noted Stalin's demand in 3rd January 1942. As regards to special interests of Soviet Union, Stalin desired the restoration of position in 1941 prior to the German attack in, with respect, in respect to the Baltic states, Finland and Bessarabia. Stalin also wanted back Eastern Poland. Eden told Churchill, I am clear that this question is for Stalin, the acid test of our sincerity. Nothing we and USA can do or say will affect the situation at the end of war. If Russians are victorious, they will be able to establish these frontiers and we shall certainly not turn them out. Churchill replied, the 1941 frontiers of Russia were act acquired by acts of aggression in shameful collusion with Hitler. The transfer of people of Baltic states to Soviet Russia against their will will be contra contrary to the all, all the principles for which we are fighting this war. I know President Roosevelt holds this view as strongly as I do. These principles were at enshrined in the Atlantic Charter. These principles guaranteed independence of nations conquered by Hitler. Eden argued, what mattered more than principles was Stalin's cooperation both now and in the future. Probably Stalin's demand is intended as an acid test to see what value we attach to that cooperation and what sacrifice of principle we are prepared 
to make in order to achieve it. On 7th March 1942, Churchill wrote, wrote to Roosevelt, The increasing gravity of the war has led me to feel that the principles of Atlantic Charter ought not to be construed as to deny Russia the frontier she occupied when Germany attacked her. The next day, the British ambassador to Washington, Lord Halifax, was summoned to the White House to discuss Churchill's cable. Roosevelt agreed with Churchill. FDR's mind is already moving along the only remaining line. That is of saying to Stalin, we'll recognize his need for security. That to put anything on the paper now is impossible. The future of Baltic states clearly depends upon Russian military progress and that neither United States nor Great Britain would or could turn them out. Why then should Stalin worry? Roosevelt made it clear in a chatty conversation, in a chatty letter to Churchill on 18th March. I know you will not mind my being brutally frank when I tell you I think I can personally handle Stalin better than either your foreign office or my state department. Stalin hates the guts of all your top people. He thinks he likes me better and I hope he will continue to do so. In, 19, in April 1942, Stalin sponsored Jewish anti-fascist committee to garner Jewish and foreign support for the Soviet war effort. Stalin also ordered Soviet counter-attack on German-held Kharkov in Ukraine, which ended in failure. In May 1942, Stalin's minister Molotov landed in Scotland. Stalin had given Molotov a list of territories Britain must agree as a part of USSR. Then Hitler launched his summer offensive. Germany smashed Russia at Kharkov. Now Stalin became desperate. He cabled Molotov to sign the treaty and stop arguing about territory. Stalin on 24th May 1942. The questions of future borders will be decided by force. In June 1942, the German army began a major offensive in southern Russia to take over Soviet oil fields in the Caucasus. On 20th July 1942, Stalin issued Order 227, barring Red Army retreats by using blocking attachments at the rear to stop retreating. This order is famously known for its line, not a step back. On August 1942, Winston Churchill flew to Moscow to visit Stalin. After landing in Moscow, he told reporters, we will continue hand in hand like comrades and brothers until every vestige of Nazi regime has been beaten into the ground. General Alan Brooke noted, the two leaders, Churchill and Stalin, are poles apart as human beings. <clears throat> and I cannot say friendship between them as, such as exists between Roosevelt and Winston. Stalin is a realist with little flattery about him. Facts only count with him. Plans, hypotheses, future possibilities mean very little. Churchill told, told Stalin that invasion of France must be postponed until 1943. He then presented his plan. At first, Germany will be driven out of Africa. He drew a map in shape of a crocodile. The hard snout was heavily defended coast of France. Rather than attacking Hitler there, he wanted to attack Hitler from what he called the soft underbelly of Europe, the Adriatic and the Balkans. Stalin asked a lot of questions, but the next day, Stalin's mood changed. He accused British of cowardice. Stalin said, you British are too afraid to fight the Germans. If you tried it like us Russians, you would not find it so bad. Churchill was furious. Churchill said, I have come all around Europe in midst of my troubles. Yes, Mr. Stalin, I have my troubles as well as you, hoping to meet the hand of comradeship, and I am bitterly disappointed I have not that hand. Later that night, Churchill decided to leave Moscow. But Stalin was impressed by Churchill's passion. On the third night, a banquet at the Kremlin broke the ice. Molotov proposed the toast. By the end of the dinner, Stalin walked around the table to click glasses with various people he was proposing the health of. During the dinner, Churchill make, made an aside that Stalin was a peasant whom he can handle. His aides were horrified and warned him that Russians have bugged their rooms. Churchill said very loudly, Russians, I have been told, are not human beings at all. They are lower in the scale of nature than orangutan. 
Now then, let them take that down and tra- translate it into Russian. Their last visit was cordial. Stalin had asked Churchill to dine with him in his private apartment. Churchill seized on the invitation and two of them ate and drank long into the night, later joined by Molotov. At last, Churchill felt he had made a f- personal breakthrough. The Soviet leader laughed and joked. Even if in the process he revealed the ruthlessness of his regime by openly admitting that the communists had killed the Soviet kulaks, the rich peasants. But still, thought Churchill, Stalin had at least allowed a glimpse into the more intimate side of his character. Churchill rose, wrote to Roosevelt after returning to his country, On the whole, I am definitely encouraged by my visit to Moscow. Now they know the worst and having made their protests are entirely friendly. On 23rd August 1942, the Battle of Stalingrad began, which would have major consequences on Eastern Front. Two months later, Stalin's message to his ambassador in London showed that Churchill was wrong. We, were, we in the Moscow get the impression that Churchill is aiming at the ultimate defeat of the Soviet Union in order then to come to some agreement with Germany at the expense of our country. By October 1942, the idea of blocking detachments was quietly dropped. By late 1942, American Land Lease program began reaching Soviet Union. In 1942, Stalin was also named Man of the Year by Time magazine. During the war, Stalin became more tolerant of arts and religion. By early 1943, Soviet factories had be- finished moving to eastern parts of USSR, away from German war machine, and were now in full output capacity. In, f- in February 1943, the German troops attacking Stalingrad surrendered. Stalingrad effectively t- uh, turned the tide of war against Germany and Stalin declared himself Marshal of the Soviet Union. In April 1943, Germany announced the bodies of thousands of Polish officers had been found in Katyn Forest, shot by Russians in 1940. Moscow rejected these claims as Nazi propaganda. At, at a private lunch, Ch- Churchill said, Alas, the German revelations are probably true. The Bolsheviks can be very cruel. Katyn damaged the relationship of USSR and Britain. The Polish government in London demanded an investigation. Stalin said the demand by London Poles was a hostile act against USSR. He used this as an excuse to break off relations with them. Roosevelt decided to be the person to bring the West and USSR together instead of Churchill. On 5th of May 1943, Roosevelt wrote Stalin a private letter asking for an informal one-to-one get-together. He suggested to meet at the Bering Straits. He dispatched Joseph Davis, his ambassador to Moscow, to deliver the letter, letter to Stalin. At the time, Churchill was in Washington, but Roosevelt did not tell Churchill anything about his letter. On 26th May, Roosevelt received a positive reply from Stalin. As I do not know how, The events will develop on the Soviet-German front in June. I shall not be able to leave Moscow during that month. I therefore suggest holding the meeting in July or August. But the invasion of France by Americans and British was postponed to 1944. Stalin responded, The Soviet government cannot align itself with this decision, which was adopted without its participation. In August, Stalin turned down the meeting using pressures of war as an excuse. Churchill met Roosevelt in Quebec, Canada in August 1943. Churchill remarked, Stalin is an unnatural man. There will be grave troubles. But Churchill reluctantly agreed to prioritize France over Balkans and Eastern Europe. In September 1943, Stalin met Patriarch Sergius, head of Russian Orthodox Church. The Comintern was dissolved in 1943. Stalin encouraged Marxist-Leninist parties to emphasize nationalism to broaden their appeal. In October, Anthony Eden told his secretary, the PM spoke for three hours. He talked great nonsense. He was furious. The PM kept saying things such as, we mustn't weaken Germany too much. We may need her against Russia. The cabinet colleagues were horrified at all this. Stalin's suspicions were not outlandish. 
In October, a series of conferences between foreign ministers of USSR, UK, USA took place in Moscow called Moscow Conference. Eden Cable Churchill about Stalin's insistence on invasion of France called it Operation Overlord. For Stalin, this conference was a victory. It was agreed that all liberated territories will be administered by occupying power. Stalin told his close associates, Now the fate of Europe is settled. We shall do as we like with the Allies' consent. In November 1943, Stalin met with Churchill and Roosevelt, now known as the Big Three in Tehran, a location chose by, chosen by Stalin. Roosevelt tried to befriend Stalin by making fun of Churchill. On third morning, Roosevelt said, Winston is cranky this morning. He got up on the wrong side of bed. Stalin smiled. Roosevelt teased Churchill about his Britishness, his habits. More Churchill was read, the bigger Stalin smile got. Finally, he laughed. At the, at the Tehran conference, Churchill and Roosevelt presented Stalin a sword to commemorate victory at Stalingrad. Stalin handed it to Voroshilov, who dropped it immediately by holding it upside down. At the conference, the trio agreed to breaking up of Germany to avoid its military rise again. Poland would be compensated with land from Germany. The Baltic states would become a part of USSR. Stalin and Roosevelt got along and Stalin was respectful towards Roosevelt, unlike with Churchill. Both Stalin and Roosevelt agreed to dismantling of British Empire. They also agreed to open a second front against Germany in the West to ease the pressures from the Soviet. Stalin declared, our directive should stipulate in conformity with the desires of the Russians as an invasion in the south of France. The operation in Mediterranean of which Churchill speaks are merely diversionary. By the end of 1943, Soviets reoccupied half of territory last lost to Germany, starting from late 1943 to 1944. Stalin deported various ethnic groups such as Chechens, Tatars and others to Central Asia and Siberia. On 6 June 1944, the Allies opened a second front against Germany in the West, popularly known as D-Day. In the same month, USSR made significant advances in Germany against Eastern Europe, liberating Belarusia and Baltic states and annexed them into USSR. At the end of July, Stalin wrote a letter to Roosevelt and Churchill about the Polish question. I understand the importance of Polish question for the common cause of the Allies and for this very reason I am prepared to give assistance to all Poles and to mediate in the attainment of an agreement between them. The Red Army was just 24 kilometers away from Warsaw. On 1st August 1944, the Warsaw Uprising began in Poland, largest resistance movement in World War II. It was time to coincide with German retreat from Poland ahead of, ahead of Soviet advance. On 8th August 1944, the Red Army was ready to enter Warsaw. The Polish underground asked for the help. Churchill Cable Stalin on 12th August. I have seen distressing message from Poles in Warsaw, who, after 10 days, are still fighting against considerable German forces, who have cut the city into three. The impl they implore machine guns and ammunition. Can you not give them some further help? The Red Army halted military operations to let Germans and Poland fight to weaken them both. On 16th August 1944, Stalin told Churchill, After probing more deeply into Warsaw affair, I have come to conclusion that the Warsaw action is a reckless and fearful gamble, taking a heavy toll on the population. Both Churchill and Roosevelt jointly appealed Stalin to give supply to Polish underground to either provide Soviet supplies or allow British and US airdrops by allowing Western planes to refuel from Soviets. Stalin said sooner or later the truth about handful of power-seeking criminals who launched the Warsaw Adventure will out. The next day, Churchill sent an eyewitness report to Roosevelt about horrors in Warsaw. Churchill asked Roosevelt to join him to send a second request to Stalin about refueling facilities. Roosevelt denied. Around the same time, Paris was liberated from Nazis by the Allies with French underground. On, th on 30th of August, the Red Army entered Bucharest, the capital of Romania, and were headed for Bulgaria. Stalin finally agreed for to airdrop some aid. On 2nd October, Germans won against Polish. 
about 250,000 people died in the uprising the soviet offensive resumed in october 1944 churchill met stalin in moscow after realizing the only way to keep british influence in the mediterranean was to make a deal with stalin he made a deal in what in what called in what churchill called his naughty document both churchill and stalin agreed to let 90% of romania and bulgaria under soviet union and 10% under british 90% of greece under greece under western influence and 10% under soviet influence both hungary and yugoslavia will have 50-50% influence of both british and the soviet churchill told stalin it is better to express these things in diplomatic terms and not to use the praise dividing into spheres because americans might be shocked roosevelt was not shocked at all roosevelt was reelected as the president for the fourth time he knew he wouldn't live for long and was in a hurry he had a vision of post war world in which usa ussr britain and china would act as policemen allowing the rest of the world's nations the freedom and independence but ensuring they could not start wars stalin had warmed to this idea as it would put ussr at the top table of world's nations now they wanted to turn it into reality in january in january 1945 the allies had surrounded germany in february 1945 The big three met at the Yalta conference. Stalin agreed to Roosevelt's demand of Soviet entry into the Pacific against Japanese after German, Germany's defeat. Roosevelt and Churchill conceded to Stalin's demand of Chur- German reparations and annexation of Sakhalin and Kuri Islands. The big three agreed to a United Nations organization headed by Security Council, which was Roosevelt's vision of great powers acting as policemen. Ro- Roosevelt and Churchill confirmed that a large swath of Polish territory Polish territory would be handed to USSR and Stalin promised free elections in Poland Stalin told Churchill the Soviet Union is interested in creation of mighty free and independent Poland it's a question of honor because Ch- because the Russians have committed many sins against the Poles in the past and the Soviet government wishes to make amends but Roosevelt privately told Stalin The United States will not will never lend its support in any way to any provisional government in Poland that would be inimical to your interests. Yalta was considered a success by all of the big three. Molotov expressed concerns about the sum of the wording of in the agreement that could get in Russia's way. Stalin told him, "Never mind, we'll do it our own way later." Stalin installed a puppet government in Romania without any consultation of his allies uh, the churchill had british forces crush communists in greece in poland nkvd was rounding up thousands of poles who could be troublesome for ussr churchill protested to roosevelt but roosevelt told him to wait on 17th march 16 commanders of polish underground were invited by russian commanders in poland to discuss local arrangements but it was a trap by nkvd they were sent to gulag roosevelt was now suspicious of stalin on 30th march dwight eisenhower sent a signal to stalin that the western allies were concentrating southern germany instead of berlin stalin signaled back to eisenhower the next day your plans completely coincide with the plans of the red army berlin has lost its f- former strategic importance stalin summoned zhukov and Kanyev and demanded who's going to take Berlin are we or the allies the red army began the race to Berlin the german commander in south asked western allies for negotiations stalin accused british and americans of doing a secret deal with the nazis to fight against russia roosevelt now was annoyed and sent an ag- sent an angry letter to stalin Frankly, I cannot avoid a feeling of bitter re- resentment towards your informers, whoever they are, for such vile misrepresentations of my actions or those of my trusted subordinates. Stalin wrote back, I have never doubted your integrity or trustworthiness, just as I have never questioned the integrity or trustworthiness of Mr. Churchill. In April 1945, the Red Army started to capture Berlin. 
on 12th April, Roosevelt died. The next day, Stalin told a delegation of Yugoslav communists, This war is not as in the past. Whoever occupies a territory also imposes on it his own social system. Everyone imposes his own system as far as his army has the power to do so. It cannot be otherwise. On 30th April, Hitler committed suicide and Germany sur- surrendered in May. Stalin hosted a victory parade on 24th June 1945 in Moscow. Stalin also adopted the title of Generalissimus in June 1945. Stalin attended Potsdam Conference in July-August 1945. Stalin pushed for reparations from Germany and war bounty to seize property from conquered nations without limits, although some limitations were allowed. Germany was divided into four zones, Soviet, US, British and French. Berlin, located with its Soviet territory, was also divided. With Germany defeated, Stalin switched his focus to Japan and transferred half a million troops to Far East. After the Soviet invasion of Manchuria in August 1945 and US nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan surrendered in September. USSR signed a treaty of friendship with China on 14th of August 1945. In the latter part of 1945, Stalin was forced to a two-month vacation due to heart problems. Let's do analyze World War II. What effects did the purges have on the Red Army? One of the most well-known reasons why Stalin purged is fear fear of emergence of military leader. This happened in France when Napoleon became first consul after the French Revolution and the Jacobin. But this also happened during Spanish Civil War where Franco rose to power after victory of nationalists. But there were other reasons for the purges. The traditional view of the purges is correct but also wrong. So what changed? And what what was the traditional view versus the modern view? Experience. There was definitely loss of experience in the Red Army. But what was the experience that was lost? Most of the people that were purged had experience in the First World War, the Russian Civil War, Soviet Polish Civil Polish War. The Second World War was a much different war than all of these other wars. The Peasant Cavalry Army is not useful when it comes to handling radio and tanks. So not much valuable experience was lost. But the moral impact of Red Army cannot be measured correctly. Numbers. Historians estimate as much as 20% of army was lost. After opening of the Soviet archives, a different pictures, picture emerges. More than 41,000 officers were purged. More than 34,000 were sacked. But by 1940, about 11,596 officers were reinstated. The Red Army actually expanded in 1930s as a reaction of Hitler's military expansion in Germany and lack of political will from other European powers to stop that. The Red Army's strength in 1935 and 1936 was 930,000 and by 1939 it increased to 1.5 million. Its long game was to reach 7 million in 1940. 161 divisions were activated between 1939 and May 1941. 80% of the officers purged in 1938 were reinstated. The new Red Army officers received training of two years. Not the best way, but many, many modern armies received training of few weeks to a year, so not exactly terrible. So why did the Red Army perform so poorly in early years of war? The answer is politicization. The purges brought back, brought back close political supervision and intervention of in the Red Army. Commissars were appointed. For example, in August 1939, the main political director of Red Army was Lev Michaelis, editor of Pravda. So a newsman held an important post to make decisions of the army. This politicization had a negative impact on the Red Army. Officers were demoralized and cautious to take decisions as anything would be judged by political officers as infringement of the party line. 
carried the risk for officers and their families. This promoted politics over competence. Of course, the new recruits were supportive of purges, but the older personnel were afraid. In 1935, the German Wehrmacht had 100,000 men, including 4,000 4, officers. In 1939, it increased to 3.7 million with 100,000 officers. So did Germany defeat? Did Germany suffer from exactly the same changes as Red Army? Either both Germany and USSR suffered from expansion or they didn't. Stalin and Hitler sacked generals throughout the Second World War. People who called them madmen and criticized their decision were mostly the generals themselves or the historians who considered their statements as facts. It is not mentioned much nowadays that for United States, World War II began as a series of, with a series of dismissals across the top ranks of military, less than two weeks after the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941. Admiral Husband Kennell and Army Le- Lieutenant General Walter Short were jettisoned from their post atop the American military establishment in the Pacific, along with Major General Frederick Martin, Short's air commander. One third of Navy's submarine captains were relieved during the first year of the war. The officer presiding over this dynamic and ruthless system of personnel management was General George C. Marshall, who, bought, who back in wa- Washington was winnowing the ranks of the army, forcing dozens of generals into retirement because he believed they were too old and lacking in energy to lead soldiers in combat. Eisenhower said, He got them out of war, and I think as a whole he was right. I was one of the youngest people that he pushed up into very high places. At one point, Marshall, ugged by erratic quality of staff work in the Army Air Force and wanting to reward talent and maturity when he saw it, promoted a major directly to Brigadier General, skipping altogether the ranks of Lieutenant Colonel and Colonel. While sometimes mistaken and occasionally brutal to individual officers, the martial system generally achieved its goal of producing military effectiveness. To understand how, the, bl- the best place is to begin with Dwight D. Eisenhower, who just a year before the start of World War II was still a lieutenant colonel, not even in command of a regiment let alone the armies of millions he could oversee a few years later. In conclusion, the purges in the Red Army didn't affect its performance in the negative way. It, in fact, it probably improved the Red Army and prepared it to fight the modern war. What affected the performance was lack of material and politicization. It is known that Stalin wanted to delay delay the war against Germany as USSR wasn't completely ready to fight Nazi Germany in 1941. Politicization also impacted the Red Army drastically as it put decision-making power in the hands of commissars instead of competent officers. When the supply situation improved thanks to lend and officers got decision-making power instead of commissars, the Red Army saw its first major victory. Operation Uranus in Stalingrad were German army superior than the Red Army. Did the Germans lose because of winter? No. Winter does not defeat an army. Winter does not assist any army in defeating another army. Yes, Germans definitely suffered in Russian winter due to lack of winter gear. They didn't have clothing to protect themselves against winter. Sometimes, many times, their equipment froze many times, the fuel froze, but winter does not defeat a modern army. Remember, Germans invaded in summer of 1941 and were kicked out in 1943-44. That's three to four summers and three winters inside the Soviet Union. So no, Russian winter did not defeat the Nazis. Did the Germans lose because of Hitler's infle- inflexibility and lack of military defeat? leadership. No, unlike what history books tell you, Hitler wasn't an idiot when he directed some of the army group center to south 
Hitler wasn't an idiot, idiot when he told his officers to not retreat. You have to understand, after the World War, many German officers were acquired by West as their assets to understand how to fight the Soviets. What you get in history books is German military perspective, the loser's perspective. That's why you get myths like the Russian winter, Russians throwing bodies, madman Hitler. They're not going to admit their own mistakes. These German officers were thinking of defeating the Soviets just like defeating the French. They will blitzkrieg their way to Moscow and Soviets will surrender just like the, just like the French. What's blitzkrieg is fast military warfare. Only way to stop blitzkrieg is to keep fighting and slow down the enemy. The vast Soviet territory definitely helped slowing down the blitzkrieg compared to France. So these idiot officers failed to realize what Hitler had realized once they failed to take Moscow and the Caucasus in 1941. Hitler realized the blitzkrieg is over and this is a traditional war now. And this is why Hitler diverted his army to south and told his officers to not retreat. In a traditional war, industry and logistics are just as important as tactics. German generals were mostly focused on tactics while Hitler was looking at the war economy, industry and logistics. Since Hitler was dead, he couldn't give his perspective after the end of war like, generals, like his generals did. And that's why you'll get stupid myths like superiority of the German army, the Russian winter, Russian throwing bodies, Hitler being an inflexible amateur who didn't allow it retreats, etc. The infamous not a step back order. No, the Russians did not send hordes at Germany with NKVD officers shooting anyone who runs back. Just because it's called not a step back doesn't mean literally not a stepping back. What it actually is, is stopping any retreats by the Red Army. The Red Army stopped Wehrmacht in Moscow. People starved but refused to give Germans Leningrad. But in 1942, the Red Army in southern Russia kept retreating unlike their northern counterparts who stood their ground and fought the Wehrmacht. Most famous being retreat from Rostov, which Germans captured and shocked the entire USSR. How can southern forces flee while the northerners are fighting so hard? Morale in southern USSR was low. They kept hoping to keep retreating and eventually fight back. But this was dangerous as the oil fields of Caucasus would fall under German hands, something Germans were in desperate need of. That's the real reason for Directive Number 227 from Joseph Stalin. Here's an extract from Order 227. The enemy feeds more and more resources to the front and paying no attention to losses, moves on, penetrates deeper into the Soviet Union, captures new areas, devastates and plunders our cities and villages, rapes, kills and robs the Soviet people. Some units on the southern front, following the panic mongers, have abandoned Rostov. Without serious resistance and without orders from Moscow, thus covering their banners with shame, the people of our country, who treat Red Army with love and respect, are now starting to be disappointed with it, lose faith in the Red Army and many of them curse the army for its fleeing to the east and leaving the population under German yoke. Some unwise people at the front comfort themselves with argument that we can continue to retreat to east as we have vast territories, a lot of soil, many people and we will always have abundance of bread. By these arguments they try to justify their shameful behavior at the front. But all these arguments are fully false faked and working for our enemies. We no longer have the superiority over enemy in human resources and in bread supply. Continuation of retreat means to destroy us and also our motherland. Every new piece of territory that we leave to enemy will strengthen our enemy and weaken us, our defenses, our motherland. The conclusion is that it is time to stop the retreat, not a single step back. That should be our slogan from now. We need to protect every strong point, every meter of Soviet soil stubbornly till the last droplet of blood. Grab every piece of our soil and defend it 
defend it as long as it is possible. Our motherland is going through hard times. We have to stop, then throw back and destroy the enemy, whatever it might cost us. Germans are not as strong as the panic mongers say. They're stretching their strength to their limits. To withstand their blow now means to ensure victory in in the future. So what do we lack? We lack order and discipline our companies, regiments and divisions, in tank units and in the air force squadrons. This is our major drawback. We have to introduce stricter st- order and strict strong discipline in our army if we want to save the situation and defend our motherland. We can no longer tolerate the fact that the commanders, commissars and political officers allow several cowards to run the show at the battlefield, that the panic mongers carry away other soldiers in their retreat and open their way to enemy. Panic mongers and cowards are to be exterminated at sight. From now on, the iron law of discipline for every officer, soldier, political or, or officer should be not a single step back without order from higher command. Company, battalion, regiment and division re- commanders as well as the commissars and political officers of corresponding ranks who retreat without orders from above are traitors of motherland. After their winter retreat under the pressure of Red Army, when morale and discipline failed in German troops, Germans took strict actions let, that led to pre- pretty good results. They formed 100 penal companies that were comprised of soldiers who broke discipline due to cowardice and in, or instability. They have deployed them at the most dangerous sections of the front have, and have ordered them to redeem their sins by blood. Further on, they have formed around 10 penal battalions comprised of officers who had broken discipline due to cowardice and instability, deprived them of their decorations and put them at even more dangerous sections of the front and ordered them to redeem their sins by blood. At the last, the Germans have formed special guard units and deployed them behind unstable divisions and ordered them to execute panic panic mongers at the site if they tried to leave their defensive positions without order or if they tried to surrender. The Supreme Command of the Red Army orders. Number 1. The military council of the fronts and of first of all front commanders should in all circumstances, decisively eradicate retreat attitude in troops and with an iron hand prevent propaganda <coughs> that we can and should continue the retreat to east. And in and this retreat will not harmful will not be harmful to us. In all circumstances, remove from offices and send to Stavka for court martial those army commanders who have allowed their troops to retreat at will without authorization from the front by the front command. C. Form within each front, 1 to 3, depending on situation, penal battalions, 800 personnel, where commanding senior commanders and political officers of corresponding ranks from all services who have broken discipline due to cowardice or instability should be sent. These battalions should be put on the more difficult sections of the front, of a front, thus giving them an opportunity to redeem their crimes against the motherland by blood. Number two, the military council of armies and first of all army commanders should, in all circumstances, remove from officers' corps and army commanders and commissars who have allowed their troops to retreat at will without authorization by army command and to send and send them to military councils of the front for court martial. B. Form three to five well armed guard units. Deploy them in the rear of unstable situations and oblige them to execute panic mongers and cowards at the site. In case of panic and chaotic retreat, thus giving faithful soldiers a chance to their duty before the motherland. So few things become clear. The command was directed at officers, not troops. Unlike the myth that's become more popular and shown in the movie Enemy of the Gates. The order applied to unauthorized retreats only. Not all retreats were unauthorized. Some were authorized. Some were allowed. Germans also had court martials for retreating officers. So did the British and the Americans. Only less than 500,000 people served in the penal battalions out of Red Army of 35 million. Total number of people shot are 158,000. Compare that to total 
एट मिलियन डेथ्स द मिथ इज बस्टेड दिस ऑर्डर अपलिफ्टेड द सोवियत मोरल इंस्टेड ऑफ डिस्पेयर ग्रेड एंड लैक ऑफ विल टू फाइट एंड कंटिन्यू रिट्रीटिंग टू फाइट अनादर डे द सोवियट्स वेर फील्ड विथ हेट रेड ऑफ जर्मन्स एंड फैशिस्ट वेंजन्स फॉर द क्राइम्स कमिटेड बाय जर्मन्स अगेंस्ट द मदरलैंड सो वाय जर्मनी रियली फेल्ड अगेंस्ट यू एस एस आर मोस्ट पीपल डोंट थिंक अबाउट द फैक्ट दैट डिस्पाइट हिटलर वॉन्टिंग टू अवॉइड अ टू फ्रंट वॉर जर्मनी इन्वेडेड ब्रिट यू एस एस आर वाइल इट वॉज एट वॉर विद ब्रिटेन रीजन्स गिवन आर जर्मनी थिंकिंग ब्रिटेन इज फिनिश्ड हिटलर बिकेम पैरानॉइड अबाउट स्टार इन मैक्स टैबिंग हिम वेन एवर यू रीड अबाउट वर्ल्ड वॉर टू जर्मन वेर मार्क्ट You know about its tank. You know about the Luftwaffe, their air force. What you don't know is the horses that were that the Wehrmacht was using behind those tanks. You read about Hitler diverting his army away from Moscow and towards southern Russia and Stalingrad. Most people don't know that Britain and USSR jointly occupied Iran during World War Two. So, what really happened? the answer is food and oil shortages thanks to the british blockade the entire continental europe under nazi occupation was suffering from food and oil shortages the only way to solve these problems was to invade ussr and occupy ukraine the breadbasket of europe to solve the food shortages and the caucasus armenia azerbaijan and georgia as well as russian dagestan and chechnya to solve the oil crisis by the way this is also the reason why russia invaded georgia in 2008 and ukraine in 2002 2022 when they tried to join nato but russia didn't invade baltic states when they tried to join nato that is why german defeat in stalingrad was turning point of the war that is why germany lost the war but the narratives of like the german efficiency russian winter soviet hordes madman hitler making wrong decisions to turn army south instead of fighting for moscow became popular of what after world war 2 that's because those narratives were created by german generals like franz halder and Fra- and heinz guderian who blamed everything except themselves but those german officers were wrong and hitler was right Here's an exception excerpt from Guderian. Hitler said that the raw materials and agriculture of Ukraine were vitally necessary for future prosecution of war. He w- spoke once again of the need of neutralizing the Crimea, that Soviet aircraft carrier for attacking the Romanian oil fields. For the first time I heard him use the phrase my generals know nothing of economic aspects of war. Hitler's word all led up to this. He had given strict orders that the attack on Kiev was to be an immediate strategic object and all actions were to be carried out with that in mind and here i saw for the first time a spectacle with which i was later to become very familiar all those present nodded in agreement with every sentence that hitler uttered while i was left alone with my point of view most people think his generals were right and hitler was wrong because of the outcome of war they because they lost the war and hitler wasn't there to defend his decisions those popular but false narratives from german generals became popular but his generals were thinking only strategically and maybe they were right if europe under nazi occupation were wasn't suffering from food and oil shortages they were thinking about smashing the soviets with the same blitzkrieg tactics just like they smashed france they were thinking about wider aspects of war that's why his generals were wrong and hitler was right that's why when his generals disobeyed him yes they disobeyed hitler in 1941 and went to moscow and leningrad instead of caucasus in 1941 he assumed direct command of wehrmacht and dismissed those generals that's why he didn't allow his army to retreat despite desperate pleas from his officers europe under nazi occupation needed that oil for its industry and economy could to continue stalin knew this as well marshal timoshenko in his speech to the supreme defense council in november 1941 said if germany succeeds in taking moscow that is obviously a grave disappointment for us but it by no means disrupts our grand strategy germany would get 
gain accommodation but that would but that alone will not win the war only thing that matters is oil as we remember germany kept harping on about her own urgent oil problems in her economic bargain bargaining with us from 1939 to 1941 so we have to do all we can a to make germans increase our oil consumption and b to keep german armies out of caucasus stalin told deputy commissar nikolai bybekov bybekov that if he doesn't destroy the oil fields before germans capture them he would be shot so when germans captured part of caucasus they found the oil fields so thoroughly destroyed they were impressed by the soviet efforts of course the generals post war laugh at this idea by pointing out they're fighting the war until 1945 but again they were using horses instead of trucks their economic output declined they kept fighting using synthetic oil which were destroyed by usa in 1944 and 1945 they didn't require much oil fighting a defensive war instead of offensive war that they wanted to fight against ussr and britain why didn't ussr face the same logistical challenges when invading berlin there are multiple reasons for soviets not suffering the same logistical challenges on their way to berlin as germans did to on their way to moscow soviets fought a defensive war for the most part the soviets fought german for germans in ussr from 1941 to 1944 the defenders always have logistical advantages over the invaders they managed to defeat russia defeat germany in ussr because they defeated germany in ussr they faced weak resistance on their way to capturing berlin from late 1944 to 45 germans were fighting a three front war ussr in their east usa and uk in their west and south germans had fuel problems and soviet didn't soviets had their own oil and captured german supply when they captured romania ussr also received supplies from west starting from 1942 to 43 thanks to wendlitz unlike what most historians say the soviets didn't move all of their factories from western ussr to urals or siberia it's impossible to move tons of machines machinery that fast normally let alone in the time of war lendlitz kicked in properly in 1943 and 44 european infrastructure was much better than the ussr german uh, germans destroyed as many ra- railroads and bridges as they could but still european roads were much better than soviets and trucks were used part of soviet logistics on their way to berlin in 1946 the state published stalin's collected work on 17th january 1946 the first session of un security council began on 5th march 1946 winston churchill in his sinews of peace said from stettin in the baltic to trieste in adriatic an iron curtain has descended across the continent in the post war period there were food shortages and ussr experienced another famine in 1947 46 and 47 just like soviet famine of 32 33 it occurred due to bad weather and government policy of exporting internationally instead of helping their own citizens about 1 to 1.5 million people died allies were supposed to withdraw withdraw from their from iran within 6 months after the war but stalin refused to do so when deadline came in early 1946 this led to iran crisis of 1946 in czechoslovakia communists were elected in 1946 i wonder why i wonder how in 1947 the state brought a second edition of his official biography in december 1947 the ruble was devalued and abolished the ration book system capital punishment was also abolished in 1947 hungarian working working people's party took control in hungary after an election Stalin edited and rewrote sections of falsifiers of history and published as a series of Pravda articles in February 1948 and in book form 
This was Soviet government's perspective on 1939 Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. In March 1948, Stalin launched an anti-Tito campaign and all Eastern European communist leaders denounced Tito at the Second Common Form Conference in Ju- June 1948. In May 1948, State of Israel was de- declared as an independent state. Stalin was one of the first to extend diplomatic recognition to obtain an ally in the Middle East. However, the gathering of Jewish crowd to greet Israeli ambassador Golda Meir and Israel's gro- growing friendship with the USA angered Stalin. In June 1948, Stalin blockaded Berlin in Soviet-controlled East Germany to force its suggestions of unified Germany, which was opposed by USA and UK. The West started supplying Berlin using airplanes. In November 1948, the Stalin abolished JAC, Jewish Anti-something, and its members were tried. Anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism grew within the USSR after the government and the press launched a campaign against Zionism and Jewish culture. In 1948, Lydia Tamashik accused major medical experts of intentionally distorting medical conclusions and several security bodies of USSR were made aware of the conspiracy theory against Stalin. Stalin had doubts about the conspiracy. His daughter Svetlana stated her father was saddened by the turn of events and the housekeeper heard him saying he did not believe doctors were dishonest and the only evidence against them were the reports of Tamashek. In 1949, Stalin brought Nikita Khrushchev to Moscow by appointing him the head of city's party branch and central committee secretary. Stalin initiated military buildup. In March 1949, North Korean leader Kim Il-sung visited Stalin and asked for help to invade South. In April 1949, North Atlantic Treaty Organization was established by the West to counter communism. In May 1949, the Brit the Berlin lock- blockade was lifted. On 23rd May 1949, western parts of Germany occupied by USA, UK and France were unified into Western Germany. In August 1949, the Soviets successfully tested their first nuclear bomb. In September 1949, the Western Germany became an independent state and in October 1949, Eastern Germany was declared as German Democratic Republic. Mao Zedong took power in China on 1st October 1949. In December, he visited Stalin to repeal the the Soviet Sino-Soviet Treaty of 1945. Stalin was concerned about Mao and wanted to avoid another T2. In January 1950, Stalin and Mao signed the Sino-Soviet Treaty of Friendship, Alliance and Mutual Assistance. In March 1950, Kim Il-sung visited Stalin again. Stalin, in May 1940, 1950 agreed to provide the support provide support for the North Korean army in June 1950 the North Korean army started the Korean War on 20th June 1950 Stalin wrote an article in Pravda Marxism and Problem of Linguistics capital punishment was reinstated in 1950 Stalin took holidays that lasted several months at his Abkhazian dacha in 1950 due to his declining health in 1951 Stalin initiated a purge of Georgian communists leading to 11,000 deportations called the Mingrelian Affair. He spent several months at his Abkhazian dacha in 1951 due to his poor health. The killer doctor's case was revived in 1952. Stalin had one doctor imprisoned in January 1952 after the doctor suggested that he should retire to improve his health. He mistrusted doctors because of allegations of Lydia Tamashek and an investigation by MGB, which was called NKVD before. Stalin published his last book, Economic Problems of Socialism, in the USSR. Stalin also eliminated the Politburo and replaced it with Presidium. In September 1952, several Kremlin doctors were arrested, an event known as the Doctor's Plot. In 
October 1952, he gave an hour and a half speech at Central Committee plenum. Around January 1953, three percent of Soviet population was in Gulag. By 1953, the Red Army was built up to 5.8 million soldiers by Stalin. On 1st March 1953, Stalin's staff found him semi-conscious in his own urine on the bedroom floor. The next day, his children Svetlana and Vasily were called to his dacha, and Vasily was sent back for misbehavior. Stalin was hand-fed, hand-fed, and given various medicines and injections, but he succumbed to his death on fifth of March, nineteen fifty-three, because of cerebral hemorrhage. The collective leadership, which included Nikita Khrushchev, Lavrenti Beria, Georgi Malenkov, Vyacheslav Molotov, Clement Voroshilov, Nikolai Bulganin, Lazar Kaganovich, and Anastas Mikoyan, started to implement. reforms the east taxation scaled back mass construction project state security and gulags were reformed torture was banned mass amnesty was ensured for those imprisoned for non political crimes and doctors were released they pursued re- negotiations to end the korean war in july 1953 after stalin died there was again a power struggle in communist party Nikita Khrushchev won the power struggle. The 20th Congre- Congress of Communist Party of the Soviet Union was held between 20- 14 and 25th February 1956. On the on the last day during a closed session, Nikita Khrushchev gave a speech on the cult of personality and its consequences. This speech is famously called the secret speech. This revealed to the communist world the horrors of Stalinist regime. and all the blame was placed on stalin this speech began the process famously known as de-stalinization many prisoners were released gulags became less harsh for those who remained stalin's body was relocated from lenin's mausoleum in the red square to the kremlin wall necropolis many of stalin's monuments across ussr were removed dismantled or destroyed many buildings and places had their names changed Most famous among them was the city of Stalingrad which had its name changed to Volgograd biggest ni- change perhaps was the change in foreign policy of USSR Khrushchev wished for peaceful coexistence with the west believing that they would eventually become like USSR Khrushchev's foreign policy allowed neutral nations which wasn't the case under Stalin reactions to de-stalinization were mixed de-stalinization split the communist world It was one of the reasons for Sino-Soviet split. Mao strengthened his cult of personality in response to de-Stalinization. There was a failed coup attempt against Kim Il-sung of DPRK, North Korea, after which he strengthened his cult of personality as well. The communist leader of Albania, Enver Enver Hoxha, condemned Khrushchev as revisionist and severe diplomatic re- relations. This also caused anti-soviet or anti-communist uprisings in Poland and Hungary in 1956 many intellectuals spec- have speculated khrushchev's motivation behind de-stalinization alexander solzhenitsyn thought khrushchev spoke out of a movement of the heart this the communists believe would prevent a fatal loss of self-belief and restore unity within the party historian Mac- martin macaulay argued that Khrushchev wanted to liberate party officials from fear of repression to make it more efficient Khrushchev was also undermining the credibility of Vyacheslav Molotov George Malenkov Lazar Kaganovich and other opponents where they have to support Khrushchev or they'll get banished like Stalin and get associated with his dictatorial control historian J R Getty commented in 1985 that Khrushchev's revelations are almost sel- entirely self-serving it is hard to avoid the impression that the revelations had political pur- purposes in khrushchev's struggle with molotov malenkov and kaganovich polish philosopher leszek kowalski Kol- kolakowski criticized khrushchev in 1978 for failing to make any analysis of the system stalin presiding over stating Stalin had simply been a criminal and a maniac 
personally took the blame for all of nation's defeats and misfortunes as to how and in what social conditions a bloodthirsty paranoid could for 25 years exercise unlimited despotic power over a country of 200 million inhabitants which throughout that period had been blessed with the most progressive and democratic system of government in human history to this enigma the speech offered no clue whatsoever all that was certain was that the soviet system and the party itself remained impeccably pure and bore no responsibility for tyrant's atrocities stalin's legacy is complicated it's mostly negative for sure but still complicated for most westerners and anti-communist russians he was a mass murderer dictator tyrant for many russians and georgians he is a great state builder and statesman the problem is both of those things are correct both of these perspectives are correct stalin stabilized the anarchic bolshevik state of lenin and made made ussr third or fourth largest industrial power before world war 2 but a lot of people starved under his rule you must understand how weird this is after world war 2 USSR became second largest industrial power while its population was starving how can you build one of two superpowers a communist empire while your own subjects are starving that's what makes his legacy complicated his legacy is tainted further by trotsky's propaganda trotsky's propaganda was best portrayed by george orwell's book animal farm stalin's policy and their horrific results served as a great anti-communist propaganda for the west but it allowed communist to say it wasn't real communism well it wasn't real marxism or communism but it was real socialism or marxist leninism as for stalin's most famous policies they were endorsed by lenin and trotsky rapid industrialization was originally trotsky's policy which stalin opposed for political purposes siding with slow industrialization policies of bukharin or because of his lack of lack of conviction but stalin implemented rapid industrialization himself after he realized how far behind the ussr was compared to us europe and usa stalin implemented collectivization of agriculture something that lenin tried but paused due to immediate decline in agricultural productivity lenin had to reintroduce capitalism under new economic policy nep and wanted to restart collectivization later on which he couldn't do because he died too soon what about the secret police post world war 2 the secret police was called kgb under stalin it was called nkvd before stalin it was called cheka Even the Russian Tsar had a secret police called Okhrana. So Stalin wasn't the only one who created the secret police. Stalin wasn't the one who created the secret police, but he increased its pol- powers and quotas. The terms Red Terror and Great Terror are both used to describe Stalin's despotic rule. But the Red Terror was introduced under Lenin and and was increased under Stalin. which be which became the greater which became the greater the later became the greater under stalin so many of stalin's policies were were not his own when confronted trotsky's replies were basically it's not real socialism or i would have done it different i understand why marxist or marxist leninist would try to dismiss stalin's horrors as stalin's own despite despite the policies were endorsed by other marxist leninist or bolsheviks but why would the capitalist lie about trotsky being an idealist who was destroyed by psychopathic stalin all he, all the capitalist have to do is point out how horrible stalin's policies are and how they were actually marxist leninist and how trotsky was li- lying about being a genuine ideological successor to lenin i have debunked trotsky's propaganda in the first part of joseph stalin under the purges section what this second part or world war 2 shows is how good stalin was as politician while his economics and ethics need a lot of improvements his understanding of geopolitics is almost second to none compared to his other equivalents before and during world war 2 the signing of non aggression pact with hitler 
came after the USSR was denied an alliance by England, France and Poland. You have to understand in 1930s, there were mainly three types of major European powers. Imperialist democracies. Imperialist democracies. Like England and France. Fascists like Germany and Italy. And socialist USSR. All three of these hated each other. So the winner would be the one who can maneuver and come out with minimum to no damage in an eventual conflict. Stalin's plan was to let the imperialists and fascists fight each other and weaken each other and USSR would go on the offensive in 1943. What Stalin couldn't predict is the sudden fall of France. But everyone, including USSR, UK, Germany, Italy and even the ordinary French citizen themselves couldn't predict the fall of France. After World War II, the fascists lost and imperialist Europeans were too broke to continue their own empires and their industrial power was destroyed. While the USSR suffered heavy damage, about 25 million people out of 75-80 million people that died during World War II. It, along with USA, came out on top after World War II. USA and USSR occupied Europe and they became first and second largest industrial powers in the world. Again, I'm not talking about ethics. I'm just talking geopolitics here. You can't change the fact that many Russians and Georgians admire Stalin because he led USSR through victory in a struggle against Nazism while Stalin killed millions of people intentionally and unintentionally. Holocaust was waiting for USSR because of Hitler's ambitions in the East and his genocidal imperialism. Stalin was a despot trying to build an utopia for them by introducing economic equalities while Hitler was trying to build an utopia by exterminating them. So USSR and Eastern Europe didn't really have good choices. I don't know what to say. According to historian Kevin McDermott, Interpretations of Stalin range from sycophantic and adulatory to the vitriolic and condemnatory. McDermott nevertheless cautioned against over-simplistic stereotypes promoted in the fiction of writers like Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Vasily Grossman and Anatoly Rebekov that portrayed Stalin as an omnipotent and am- omnipresent tyrant who controlled every aspect of Soviet life through repression and totalitarianism. Historian Robert Service suggested that the country might have collapsed long before 1991 without Stalin. According to Service, Stalin had come closer to personal despotism than any monarch in history by late 1930s. Service also warned of the portrayal of Stalin as an unimpeded despot, noting that powerful though he was, his powers were not limitless, and his rule depended on his willingness to conserve the Soviet structure he had inherited. According to historian Stephen Kotkin, Stalin built a personal dictatorship within Bolshevik dictatorship. But his ability to remain in power relied on him having a majority in the Politburo at all times. I think Stalin was possibly the most powerful man of 20th century. The things that he did or happened under him puts him right next to warlords like Napoleon, Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, etc. in terms of territory control. Only in terms of territory control. I don't think he was a psychopath who exploited a communist revolution, but an idealist who believed in horrible collectivist ideology of Marxism and Marxist-Leninism that would kill millions of people almost everywhere it was implemented. So, what do you think of Joseph Stalin? Now that everything is available. I'm guessing the answer would depend on your nationality. Anyway, this was kind of a rough year for me. In fact, this was probably worse year for me than 2020. Took me long enough to finish this topic because of all the hurdles that I faced. But now it is finished and I feel happy. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. If you have liked this episode, hit the like button if you know someone who is interested in the first half of 20th 20th century share these two episodes with them thank you so much for watching